It's been a tough few weeks for all of us. I mean, just look at the state of me. I've not shaved in a month. So with everyone feeling low, I thought I'd do a nice light video series. And we'll just talk about war crimes, ethnic cleansing, high altitude bombing and the concept of just war. So humanitarian intervention uh, as a form of just war is a slippery and contentious concept. And here we're going to use the example of Kosovo to explain why. In 1999, NATO conducted an 11 week campaign of high altitude bombing against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The primary public justification for this was on humanitarian grounds. The goal was to end the brutal campaign of ethnic cleansing by Yugoslavia against the Kosovar population. This is the example that's held up as ethical military interventionism. It is the gold standard and I want you to hold that in your mind as we go on. But it's far from a paragon of clear Western morality and in this video we're going to explore why. I'll take it in two parts. First examining the justification of the war in Kosovo and second the military tactics used in the war. Just ad bellum and just in bello are the phrases most commonly associated with the concept of just war. Just ad bellum refers to the rules governing when a state can get into war and just in bello refers to the conduct of actors during a war. And both of these uh, more frequently refer to the sort of legal justifications of war and of conduct in war. I'm not really going to get into the legalism of it because there's a whole myriad of other problems with that I don't have time to get into and it's frankly quite boring. So let's just start talking about uh, Just Ad Bell and where the reasons behind the NATO intervention in Kosovo just. Well in the first instance there certainly was humanitarian concern. Much of the justification for war was in terms of stopping the ethnic cleansing, the crimes against humanity in Kosovo, uh, and this was the same justification given by all NATO states, and the narrative that was used within uh, states to sell to various populations. For example, in the UK, then Foreign Secretary Robin Cook sold the war to the left of the Labour Party as like a form of ethical foreign policy. It seems likely to me that various actors involved here did have a degree of humanitarian concern, Although, I might be a sweet summer child inculcated by naivety and I've been burned by that before, recently. What is true though, is that humanitarian concerns, as we see in lots of cases, and things like democracy, are often invoked to justify military interventionism, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, those concerns are founded. I think there were humanitarian concerns here, but there were certainly others as well. Another justification that uh, NATO made at the time was the idea of uh, Kosovo threatening international peace and security. So this was used as a justification for intervening in Kosovo's uh, and several states expressed fear that they would have to absorb high numbers of refugees within their borders uh, and it was very much in NATO's interest to end the conflict and displacement at its borders. On top of this there was a question of the political legitimacy of NATO and the morality of Western forces after the failure to act in the genocide and humanitarian disasters of Bosnia and Rwanda which happened in the um, immediate years previous to Kosovo. From these failures arose a not uncommon view that uh, NATO and Western military uh, alliances were in an unstoppable decline. Arguably NATO couldn't survive uh, ignoring another humanitarian disaster, especially one on its own borders. Uh, and Western forces need the perception that they're a moral force within the world in order to, to, to project their interest, to use that soft power to project their imperialistic efforts across the globe. Maintaining Western interests is easier when you have that soft power to appeal to. 
This propagandic concern was present at the national level as well. I, again, I'm sure that some actors truly had ethical and humanitarian concerns at heart. Robin Cook, again, for example, likely believed humanitarian action to a degree given his reaction to the Iraq war, over which he resigned, and which we will get to next time. And even Tony Blair may have had empathy for his fellow man at some point. But the central place of the media in Blair's administration, and crucially within the decision-making process of NATO itself, indicates that propaganda was absolutely key in this war. For Blair, Kosovo became a test of strength for himself and his new Labour government. So he needed to win in every sense of, of the word. And, and luckily, he had an army of spin doctors to help him. So there are two clear examples of this media obsession from, from Blair in relation to Kosovo. Firstly, in the wake of NATO bombing a convoy of refugees, both Blair and Clinton were frustrated by the slow and confused reaction from the NATO media machine. And as a result, Blair sent his top aide and spin doctor Alistair Campbell to NATO to review and bolster their media operations. Alistair Campbell, by the way, is the guy who this character is literally based off of. I can rip all of your bodies to bits with my bare hands and sell off, yeah, sell off your fucking flayed skin as a sleeping bag. Campbell had an incredible amount of access in this military operation and no small amount of power. According to his biographer, by the end, Campbell was one of a handful of people intimately involved in running the war. Tony Blair often left it to Campbell to hammer out important details and delicate matters with the US president directly. Once again, the man who actively informed this character... Stand over there, right? And do not move, or I will perform a fucking living fucking autopsy on you with a fucking rusty speed and I'll have your kidneys for fucking cufflinks. A spin doctor was actively involved in running and running spin for a humanitarian war. Or I will perform a fucking living fucking autopsy on you. And this obsession with media projection of the war was a personal passion of Blair. He embarked on a tour of European states to try and shore up opinion for Western interventionism, uh, yet this tour t seemed to take on a far more like self-aggrandizement flavour with photo ops designed specifically for the UK population at home. And apparently Clinton felt it necessary to complain to Blair about his many media appearances, ordering him during a 90 minute phone harangue to pull himself together and halt the domestic grandstanding that was threatening to tear NATO apart. So, humanitarian concerns may have played a role, but the idea that this was a purely humanitarian war doesn't really hold water. This war was like any other war, a mash of different um, uh, justifications and interpretations and interests. So with that in mind, let's move into the conduct of the war itself. So how well does the conduct of the war match up with its supposed humanitarian goals? While positive media and propaganda fall into reasons why the war is pursued in the first place, it's also a tactic used for waging war. Blair and NATO used propaganda as a tool for both continuing the war and for pressuring Milosevic into giving in. That's the, the um, Premier of, the, of Yugoslavia. But it was a double-edged sword, which also affected how this humanitarian war was waged. Blair had sold the war, both to the Labour Party and the UK audience at large, as a moral mission, but also as one which would be short and have no cost in British lives. Let's go, in and out, 20 minutes adventure. As a result of this, Kosovo became the first site of remote warfare. That is, it became a campaign of high altitude bombing from a distance with no ground forces. This tactic led to charges from human rights organisations that NATO engaged in war crimes in the pursuit of a zero casualty war. While it follows that states would care about their own citizens, it doesn't fit with the humanitarian goals that the central focus was to avoid a single NATO death, which was achieved, rather than to minimise the risk of uh, the civilians that they were supposedly protecting. I think there's some serious imperialistic undertones to this as well. British and NATO lives were seen as inordinately more important 
to, than, than the lives of the uh, civilians they were supposedly helping. Now, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former um, Yugoslavia decided not to in investigate NATO for these charges, but this shouldn't be seen as a condonement of NATO action, and I'll use two examples here to show why. This was the inciting incident that caused Blair to send Campbell to NATO, as mentioned earlier. On April 14, 1999, NATO targeted a convoy of refugees after claiming to mistake them for military vehicles. NATO's defence of this was that while on military computers the vehicles could be distinguished as tractors, from a height of 15,000 feet and with the naked eye, they couldn't be clearly distinguished. What this defence therefore accepts is that the project of bombing from such high altitude carried with it an acceptance that NATO lives were more important than the risk of civilian death. If bombers flew as low as 5,000 feet, they could have identified the targets accurately, but would have been at greater risk of counterattack. The judgment from NATO was that such a risk for civilians and refugees was acceptable. On top of this, the effect of high altitude bombing on the ground conditions of Kosovo was chaotic. During the whole period of bombing, almost a million Kosovans left Kosovo, and half a million were internally displaced, and thousands of Kosovo Arabians were killed by Serb police, um, military and paramilitary. Many refugees fleeing Kosovo saw the onslaught against them as a direct consequence of NATO bombing. One refugee is reported as stating, the Serbs can't fight NATO, so now they're after us. Now, NATO contends that the process of ethnic cleansing was already underway before the bombing, and this may be the case, but there's reason to believe that such events wouldn't have continued with the same speed and ferocity if not for the chaos that NATO bombing campaign produced. And it's, it's worth noting, though, that, that if there was a Nazi-style final solution being planned to remove every last Albanian from Kosovo, it certainly was abandoned after a month of NATO bombing. So if we turn now to the weaponry used by NATO, we can again see a theme of a lack of concern for civilian lives. The day after NATO jets had dropped cluster bombs near the village of Doganovic in Kosovo, several boys were looking after livestock in a nearby field. The boys, including the five Kodza brothers aged 3 to 15, apparently found a dud American-made cluster bomb and began to play with it. The soda can sized bomb with a small parachute attached then exploded, killing all five Kodza brothers. Two other boys were seriously injured. I have been an orthopedist for 15 years now, working in a crisis region where we often have injuries, but neither I nor my colleagues have ever seen such horrific wounds as those caused by cluster bombs. The use of cluster bombs by NATO and Kosovo was in breach of the 1977 Additional Protocol to the Geneva Convention. This is because of the particularly damaging impact cluster bombs have on civilians and on particularly children. If they don't explode, cluster bombs essentially act as mines and, and can lie dormant in areas way after a conflict has ended. Often children will find such bombs and the results, as we've, we can see, are pretty horrifying. The use of this weaponry seriously undermines NATO's claim to moral legitimacy. And remember, this is the highest example of Western interventionism, the, the gold standard, the humanitarian intervention. Yet the conduct of the war was heavily slanted towards preserving NATO lives over civilian lives and included the use of weaponry which breached the Geneva Convention. So to conclude, I, I don't think it's fair to deny that there were humanitarian concerns at play in the decision to intervene in Kosovo, and nor would I deny that the intervention ultimately ended the brutal campaign by Milosevic against Kosovans. But the NATO campaign is often framed as this sort of prime example of humanitarian intervention and, and just war, and I think that there are some serious reasons for questioning such a narrative. The, the security interests of NATO states, the propagandist interests of Western actors, and the domestic interests of Blair show that the narrative of only humanitarian concerns it doesn't really hold water. 
On top of this, the tactic of high altitude bombing uh, with a policy of zero casualties for NATO shows a larger concern for NATO life over civilians in Kosovo. While the gold standard of humanitarian intervention, I think this is far from a just war. And this isn't a wholesale call for isolationism either, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, and in either the next video or the next but one, I'm going to try and talk about how we can move towards more, policy, uh, more positive foreign policy. Um, I just think that it's dangerous to frame wars like this as humanitarian and it sort of undermines the lives lost and, the, um, and glosses over the interests at play in this conflict. So to clarify the overall point I'm making here, I'm trying to show that humanitarian intervention, unless it focuses on and centralizes the victim that is trying to be helped in both justification for the intervention and the tactics used in war, is never gonna be a humanitarian intervention. And the reason I'm using Kosovo in this example is because Kosovo is held up to ha such a high standard and that shows two things. Um, firstly, it shows even at the highest standard, we've never really had a humanitarian intervention. And secondly, it shows that the label of humanitarian intervention is not a guarantee that we've got any positive foreign policy outcomes. In a later video, I will try and lay down what I think should be done, but in this situation in this case here that that's the larger point of this video. So thanks for watching this video and escaping the horror of global pandemic by watching a video on the horror of war. If you've enjoyed it remember to like, comment, subscribe and share it with anyone that you think might be interested. I'd also like to thank my first subscriber on Patreon, Paul Singleton, who asked a few questions which I think I've answered in this video uh, uh, or will be answering in the next ones but he did ask a specific question um, could it be unjust to wage a war of self-defense and to that I think I would say yes and if we look at the the two categories of just war just ad bellum and just in bello then we can see why um, it might be just to wage a war of self-defense but if the way that you wage that war is disproportionate or targets civilians or uses um, like chemical weapons, then the way that you've waged that war, the just in bello, is um, unjust. So even a war of self-defense can be unjust. So thanks again, like, comment, subscribe. If you're like Paul, maybe consider subscribing on Patreon and uh, if you're at a certain level, you, I'll answer a question in the video if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and cheers again, see you next time. Seriously, on months. Maybe Reddit's right when they call me a low T better male. <laughs> <laughs>